Well, good morning and uh, welcome once again. Weren't y'all blessed by our worship leaders? Can we just give them a quick hand? I'm really thankful for talented people that use their gifts to lead us in worship. I don't know if y'all know this about me, but I actually play a little guitar. And uh, yes, you, I know you may be surprised, but I haven't yet been invited to play on the worship band. Can't exactly figure out why. But I was about 20 years old, and I, I was in town. I was actually interning at this church, and if y'all know Josh Schneider, he's been in our church forever. Uh, he shows up one day, and he puts a guitar down in my office, and he's like, hey, I thought you needed to have this. And that was my first guitar I ever had. I was so excited, and so I set to work, and I'm learning how to play, and I got three chords down, and that's it. And I thought I was awesome, because I knew three chords, obviously. Uh, I was doing pretty good, and uh, being in college, at the time, I was back in Stillwater, and there was a family that kind of took me in, and they, they would cook, and so I knew they loved me, right? And so they, they took me and a couple of my roommates in, and we would go over there and hang out, and it just so happened that the guy, that the, the, the father of the household, he was an extraordinary guitar player. I'm not talking about like modern stuff, you know, like I'm talking the dude used to have long hair playing a rock band, guitar player, you know what I mean? Like he could rip the guitar, he was so good, and he had an epic studio in the upstairs of his house. He'd actually recorded some, some pretty famous bands in that studio, and so it was really awesome for me to go up there and like just listen to him like he could play anything he actually got bored with the guitar and so he's like hey I got a six string fretless bass watch this and he'd like play one on one guitar part on the electric guitar and the other on his bass guitar and he put them together in his studio and it, it was awesome and so I used to really enjoy just to go in and sit and listen to him and then one day he was like hey why don't you go in there in the room grab grab your guitar go in there and I'll, I'll record you playing I was like are you kidding like, I've just listened to this guy who was amazing, you know. He was, like, over the top, great, and I still know my three chords. And so I was like, okay, and I go in the little room, you know, and you have to put the headphones on. It's got the little, you know, clear window, and you can see through. And he's like, yeah, go ahead. And I'm like, I don't know. It felt like every single note was painful, and I knew it was being recorded. And when he played it back, it was indeed painful. I told you I play a little bit of guitar, and I still only play a little bit of guitar. Uh, but over time, as I did that a little more, like I got to where I could be a little more where I should have been, playing on the beat and hit the notes a little closer to the time that I should have. And it got to be fun. Now, I'm still not an accomplished guitarist. I still haven't been invited to play on the worship band. Uh, but I did have a really good time getting to enjoy like all the stuff he had there and learning the things that were available. And I tell you that story because oftentimes when people approach the Bible, in particular guys like the Apostle Paul, who we've been reading about his life in his letter to the church at Philippi. I mean, you think about the life of the Apostle Paul. He was riding uh, on the way to Damascus, riding along the road. A bright light knocked him off of his horse. It's like Jesus appears to him. Scales fall from his eyes. I mean, he's seen people healed. He's done all the things. He's writing a letter to the Philippians. He's like, do you remember when we were at Philippi and I cast a demon out of the girl and like that was amazing and then I got beaten with rods and I was in prison. There was an earthquake. He's, he's praising God while he's in chains in Rome, leading the Praetorian Guard to Christ. He's like, the gospel's going forth. And then Paul, he's just uttered these words, to live is Christ but to die is gain. Only in my life, my goal is that Christ would be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. And many of us, when we see the Apostle Paul, we're like, yeah, I don't belong on the same stage with him. We celebrate what God did through him. We're like, man, God did extraordinary things through the Apostle Paul. But we never want to step in the room, if you will, and begin to play ourselves. We never envision that God might have similar things in store for us, that God might want us as well to live as Christ. And yet, as you're going to see today, the Apostle Paul doesn't want us to sit as spectators and watch him play. That wasn't his hope at all. But instead, the Apostle Paul, his expectation is that every single believer would set foot onto the court. I'm mixing metaphors here. He would, would get onto the field. They would go in the room. They would begin to play, living out their faith just as the Apostle Paul had. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. 
He's been telling all about what God's done in and through his life, about his boldness, his courage in the face of opposition. And then he turns to them. He says, how about you? You want to give it a go? Why don't, why don't you jump in there and give it a try? Verse 27, he says, only, this is the first time he's given them instructions, only conduct yourselves. Can you just take a second and personalize that? Yeah, he was writing it to the church at Philippi a couple of thousand years ago, but here we are today reading the words of the Apostle Paul. Can you put yourself there as the recipient of the letter? Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, for many of us, that probably means a few different things. There's various levels of understanding. For some of us, when we think about Christianity, it's that thing that we've always kind of known, the thing that we've always done. Maybe you were raised in church, your first memories, you were like, you know, an infant, and you, your earliest memories were always being in church. And so for you, it's kind of a way of life. The, the Jesus, church, Christianity, it's kind of always been this way for you. Maybe if you're in this room, you're one of those, right? One of those that you have a story to tell and everybody likes to hear it because you're one of those that went way off. You were like way out and, you know, doing your own thing, living the life. And Jesus has miraculously saved you and brought you back to him. And you're like on fire for Christ because he's saved you from all of these sins. The truth of it is... Our understanding of the worth of the gospel will dictate the life that we're ultimately going to live. Your estimation of the worth of the gospel of Jesus Christ will dictate the devotion with which you will ultimately live. And so Paul, in, in speaking to the, the Philippian believers, he's like, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So can we just take a second? And walk through the gospel, okay? Maybe we'll all kind of get ourselves on an even playing field in order to understand what Paul is calling us to uh, when he says to conduct ourselves in such a way. What is true for every single one of us in this room is that we were hopelessly lost and separated from God because of our sin. Now, the sins are a little bit different. Like some of y'all have done the big ones, right? The ones that our culture would look at and be like, I can never believe that he did that thing. They might even think bad about you. They might like want to shame you for those things. And then there's some of us, like maybe those who have been raised in the whole Christian lifestyle, that maybe people don't even really know about our sin, but we do. And while no one looks down on us and condemns us, we're just as sinful and we know it in our hearts. It's the hidden sins, the things we fought against, the things that we couldn't fix on our own. But the, tr the thing that is true for every single person in this room is that our sin has separated us from a holy God. God was perfect in all of his ways. Perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, perfectly just. And because he was perfect, he was sinless. He couldn't have fellowship with sin. And so we're separated from God by our sins. Now, if we possess sin in any way, shape, form, or, or fashion, that means that, that we now owe the wage of that sin. The scriptures tell us the wage of that sin is death. And what that means is not like we physically die. Yes, that will happen to every one of us one day. But what this death is, is it is a separation from God. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. Our spiritual faculties, our ability to know God, respond to Him, walk with Him, it is dead. So we are separated from God, dead in our trespasses and sins. And to be honest with you, there is nothing that we can do to bridge the gap between us and God. Like, you can't be good enough. If you've sinned at even one point, it means you've broken the law. That means you're a lawbreaker. You don't get to unsin because you've done some good things. You still have the weight of sin hanging around your neck, right? That's just the, the nature of the thing. So here we are. We're in our sin. And let's be honest. We've all sinned in pretty grievous ways. Every one of us, if we could tell a story, there's that thing that we know is so wrong, and maybe we didn't want to do that thing. Maybe we would deeply regret that thing, but we did it. And we're separated from God. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. 
God loved you. Again, put your name in the blank. So much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die the death that you deserved. The death that I deserved. Jesus went to the cross. He, well, he came to earth and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And that perfect, sinless man died on the cross for our sins. God poured out his wrath against sin. He poured it out on his son, Jesus. He took all of our sin, that thing that you regret, that thing that you can't believe that you did, that lifetime of struggle with addiction. He took all of that and he placed it on his son, Jesus, and he poured out his wrath against sin on his son. Jesus there on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But on the cross there, God also took that righteous life of Jesus Christ, that perfect sinless life that he lived, and he credited that to the account of anyone who would just trust in Jesus to save them rather than trusting in themselves. Like some of you out there, you've wanted to live a really good life. This was true of me. I wanted to live a really good life, wanted to think well of yourselves, wanted to kind of, you know, do the right things, and yet the truth of it is, we couldn't. But for those of us who come to faith in Christ, instead of trusting in our own good works and trying to be good enough on our own, when we trust not in our good works, but in the good work of Jesus, the scriptures tell us that we are given the gift of eternal life. God takes our sin, he forgives it, and he credits to us the righteousness of Jesus. So our standing before God is no longer sin. Your sin has been atoned for. We are now united with God. Christ. We get to live. The scriptures tell us that we've been adopted. We're heirs of Jesus Christ. We are now children of God, which means we get all the blessings, all the good things available to us in Christ Jesus. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, our brokenness, our guilt, the bad things we've done. He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Now, he loved you in the very beginning enough to send his son to die for you. He didn't save you because you were good enough, but now we've been made righteous by Jesus and we get to walk with God. We get to know true and abundant life. That spiritual side of us that was dead because of our sin is now made alive. And so we get to live together with Christ. We were hopeless and now we've been given hope in Christ Jesus. And so the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Philippians, he's like, hey, conduct yourself. Live your life. This word actually means live as citizens of a a different kingdom, if you will. Uh, To be in Philippi, it was a Roman colony. If y'all know uh, kind of the history back, I believe it was 41 B.C., This was before Jesus uh, ever came and went to the cross the whole bit. Outside the city of Philippi, there was an epic battle that took place between two sets of Roman generals. The the first one was Octavian, and the first set, Octavian and Antony. You might have heard these names. Um, And they were actually battling against Brutus and Cassius. Y'all know who Brutus was? Brutus and Cassius were the guys who led the plot to assassinate Julius Caesar. Et tu, Brute, this was Brutus, right? So there's this epic battle going on outside the city of Philippi between Antony and Octavian and Brutus and Cassius. And Octavian wins the battle on this day. But it it necessitated there be a big Roman presence still in the city of Philippi. There were still, you know, those people who were resistant to Rome ruling So it became a military colony. They left a lot of soldiers there. About 10 years later, it became a Roman colony, which meant that this city, Philippi, which was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles from Rome, from Italy, it gained all the rights of Roman citizens. That meant they were treated just like they lived in Rome. And so the people there, they had right to a fair trial. They, they didn't have to pay tribute to Rome like all the other cities did. There were like these rights and responsibilities that came with citizenship. And Paul's like, hey, for those of you who are so proud of your citizenship there in Philippi, can you remember? As you think about the benefits and of citizenship, the responsibilities that come with citizenship in Rome, can you remember not only the rights that come with being citizens of God's kingdom, but also the responsibilities? Would you conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Jesus told us that the kingdom of God It's like a treasure hidden in a field. That a guy goes out and he finds that treasure. And with joy, 
He goes and sells everything he has in order to buy that field. You know what the implication is? That treasure was worth more than all that he had. You want to know the worth of the kingdom? You want to know the worth of the gospel? It's worth giving up all of your life to gain what you get in the gospel. Paul, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's not a message for apostles. It's not a message for pastors. It's not a message for the super Christians, if you will. It's a message for you. It's an encouragement for every single believer in Jesus Christ that when we leave this place, we go to the restaurant, we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. We love people as Jesus loved us. We give to people as Jesus has given to us. We forgive people as Jesus has forgiven us. We extend grace to people as Jesus has extended grace to us. In the same way with all of the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus, conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel we received. Y'all, when we deal with people outside of this church, you know what we ought to extend to them? The same thing that Jesus has extended to us. Love and grace and mercy. Forgiveness. We give ourselves to them. We serve them. We care for them. Because that's what Christ has done for us. Now, Paul is writing this letter to a little church that existed in Philippi. And Philippi was not a place that was very hospitable to the gospel. It wasn't very hospitable to Christians. So he gives them some instructions about what it, what it looks like to live a life worthy of of the gospel of Christ. Now, we live in a world where we're, we're getting a little nervous right now, right? We're afraid that there won't, we won't have religious freedom. We're afraid that maybe our government's uh, stepping beyond their bounds or the bounds of the Constitution. We're getting a little bit anxious in America, but let's be honest, we're not oppressed. We're not persecuted. We have the opportunity to live lives worthy of the gospel, unimpeded by any law, by any government, by any rulers or authority. Like, we can just go and do this. But Paul's writing a letter to people that couldn't. As a matter of fact, he'd been beaten publicly in their city for the sake of the gospel. And so he writes to them, and he tells them how to do it. I want to give you three points on what it looks like to live a life worthy of of the gospel of Christ, what it would look like, what it looked like for them, and what it will look like for us. He says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I remain absent, even if I don't get out of prison, I hope to hear that you're continuing to live these lives. He says that I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit. If we're going to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the church of Christ here on this earth in this day and this time in, in Poto and Pecola or whatever city you might live in, it means that we have to stand firm in, by the power of the Spirit of God. I don't know if you know about our culture. You've probably paid some attention. Uh, but some of the things that the scriptures would teach are not incredibly popular. As a matter of fact, they're downright offensive to people in our culture. If you were to just read passages of Scripture, people will get offended. Believe me, I know. I stand up here and I do it, and people get offended at some of the things that I say. It's a little bit true for us, but it was a whole lot true for them. When they arrested Paul and Silas at his previous on his previous trip to Philippi, the accusation were these men are teaching customs. They're teaching things that are unlawful for, for us as Romans. Christianity wasn't a legal religion, and they beat them with rods and threw them in prison as a result. And Paul writes to these believers in the same city where he'd been beaten and jailed. He's like, you want to live life worthy of the gospel? Stand firm in the Spirit. Stand firm on the truth of God's word. Don't compromise. You don't back down. You don't run away. You stand firm. That means you're not moved. You, you look in the face of opposition and you refuse to back away. You don't shrink back. You stand on the truth of God's word. And so we stand firm. For us in, in America in 2021 where we don't have all that much opposition, where we might just be unpopular if we stand in the power of the Spirit, on the truth of God's word, uh, Paul would say to us, stand firm. 
the current of culture is going to push you toward compromise. Because we don't want people to be offended at us. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to be unpopular. The current of culture presses against us. Paul would say, live a life worthy of the gospel that you received. Stand firm in the spirit. Now, this command, it anticipates opposition. Look, look what he says in verse 28. He says, in no way alarmed by your opponents. That opponents to them, that, that to the, the word, to the truth, to the way of Jesus Christ, that they would exist. That was granted. Like he, he was like, that's just given from the very beginning. You will have opponents. You just shouldn't be alarmed by them. He goes on in verse 29, he says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. So Paul's like, you're going to have opposition. Um, suffering is going to be a part of your life. If you stand firm for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you just need to know people will oppose you. You will ultimately suffer. He goes on in verse 30, he says, Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Hey, to the believers in Philippi, stand firm for the truth of God's word. Man, you're pointing people to the way of life, whether they know it or not. You continue to point people to Jesus Christ, even when you have opposition, even when you suffer, even when there's conflict in your midst. Stand firm. Don't let anything move you. Stand upon the truth of God's word. Oh, people in the city of Philippi were beaten. They were jailed just like Paul was. But they stood firm. How much more should we look at those average, ordinary people that you don't even know their names? We see the firmness of their faith. How much more should we in this free country where we don't face a lot of opposition, where very few of us have suffered for our faith, how much more should we stand firm? But our temptation is just like theirs. To compromise. I'm not really sure if the scriptures are all that true. I'm not really sure if God would want that of me. Y'all, that's called compromise. That's shrinking back. If we're going to live life worthy of the gospel, we stand firm in the power of the Spirit. Number two, the thing that Paul would say is going to characterize a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, uh, I will hear that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. The way that we can conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ is by striving together for the faith of the gospel. If standing firm means holding your ground, not being moved, not backing down, not retreating in the face of opposition, if we are going to strive together, that means taking new ground. Now, just to be really clear, we are not at war with our world. That I, I know it's kind of a military metaphor. It was a military colony. As a matter of fact, this striving together word, it's the Greek word soon Atleo. Soon just means together, and athleo is like to, to compete in a competition. This soon athleo, when you smash those two Greek words together, it was the, the word used for Roman soldiers who would fight shoulder to shoulder, side by side, like advancing in the face of opposition. That's what we're going to do, but I want to be clear. We are not at war with our friends or our neighbors or our culture. We are at war with an enemy, the powers and principalities of darkness, the forces that we can't see. When we go out into this world, we never fight against our neighbor. We're fighting for them. But the temptation is the same, to shrink back rather than striving for the faith of the gospel, to just kind of remain silent, to do what's easy, to do what's comfortable, just to sit where we are, to be with, content with the fact that the, the person next door or that family member or that coworker that they don't know Jesus, to just be like, you know, it's kind of okay, maybe somebody else will do it. What Paul is calling him to here, he's like, you want to know what a life worthy of the gospel that you've received? You want to know what worship in your life looks like? It's striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's locking arms with fellow believers and saying, we are going to live this. What we're not going to do is play this comfortable American Christian game, but instead we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross, and start following me. I don't know if you've like, read into the life of Jesus much, but where he went was to a cross, a place where he was beaten, where he suffered, where he died, nails driven through his wrists and his ankles. That's where Jesus went. Are you willing to follow him? Or are we just kind of sitting back comfortably doing our thing? Hey, Jesus, I want all the benefits, but don't ask me to get my hands dirty. That's for, that's for those super, that's for the apostles and the pastors, right? And yet Paul writes this letter to average ordinary Christians in a little town called Philippi. We don't even know their names. He points out his example and he says, now, I'm going to turn my attention to you. I want you to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Standing firm in the spirit. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. I've been challenging you guys for a few weeks to think about, like, who's that one person that I want to lead to Christ this year? And I'm going to start praying. And I'm going to have an opportunity. I'm going to ask God for opportunities to share the gospel. And I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to go to the back room. I'm not going to back away. But instead, I'm going to have other people praying for me and with me. And I'm going to step up in the moment. And I'm going to strive for the faith of the gospel. I want more people to know about the forgiveness that's available in Christ Jesus, about the goodness of the gospel. There's two lies you may be tempted to believe about you you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Two lies that really kind of render us ineffective as a church. Two lies that leave us gathering on Sundays and having no impact Monday through Saturday. The, the first lie is this. The lie that you don't need the church. The lie that you, you just you and God, Jesus is your homeboy. You can go out in the woods and, and have church out there on your bass boat. Or you can just hang out at home and do your thing. Like, you don't need the church because it's just you and Jesus. Um, that's a lie. Part of the way that the Philippian believers were able to be a faithful witness was they, they stood together. They stood firm, striving together. Like there was no option for them to do this independently. They locked arms together. They encouraged one another. Paul called them partners in the gospel. He talked about this intimate relationship they had because they were in it together. In, in the same way that if we were in a, like a legit war, like a bunch of soldiers all going their own way, doing their own thing, aren't terribly effective. But instead, when they work as one, when they work as a unit, they stay together, they're going to be much more effective. It's true for us as a church. The first lie the enemy is going to tell you is that you don't need the church. Man, just go, just go live your life for Jesus and it won't matter. You need other people in your life to encourage you when you're down, to cheer you on when you're doing good, to be there when you're sick, to challenge you at times when you may be wrong. You need the church, and the second lie the enemy would tell you is that the church doesn't need you. The enemy would love for you to think you're some, like, B-team Christian. Now listen, let, let the professionals take care of the, the ministry work. Let the professionals strive together for the faith. But you know what Paul has said here? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit. With one mind, the same spirit that lived in the Apostle Paul now lives in you if you've come to faith in Christ. He lives in me. The same spirit of God which led the apostles to be martyred for their faith will lead us to share the gospel for our friends. You're not a second-rate Christian, and this church needs you. The world needs us united together, striving for the faith of the gospel. So again... Standing firm in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And the final thing here, in no way alarmed by your opponents. This is an interesting uh, phrase. There's a, like a lot of things that you can draw out of this as you like read the scriptures here. Uh, the Philippians could not have felt like they were the most powerful like believers out there. They're pretty young believers. Hadn't been following Christ all that long. They probably didn't like know every verse of the Bible or have all their doctrine just right. But he says, you have no need to be alarmed by your opponents. As a matter of fact, you need to have confidence in the face of opposition. Like, you don't have to worry. And the funny thing is that the enemy got this probably more than we do. Look what happens when we stand firm in the Spirit. 
on the truth of God's word, when we strive together for the faith of the gospel, look at the response of the enemy. It says in verse 28 that it is a sign of destruction to them. When the enemy sees us standing firm, striving together in no way alarmed, the enemy's like, this battle's over. I'm going to lose. Like, I, I'm not going to win here. I see the church of Jesus Christ united, standing firm, not compromising, not sitting back, refusing to go and take the gospel. But when the enemy sees the church get busy, the enemy knows the game is over. The truth of it is, you read throughout the scriptures, you read the end of the New Testament, Jesus is going to be victorious over all of this. Like we know the end of the story as believers in Jesus Christ. And we know that we may not get to see all the fruit. That yes, we may live lives of suffering and things may get difficult for us. But we know that in the end, we have the victory in Christ Jesus. In no way alarmed by your opponents. This, this word alarmed, again, lots of military metaphors here. I think Paul did it intentionally for the church at Philippi. Um, there were horses that they would ride. If you remember the, the cavalry, you would ride a horse out into battle. And the trouble with the horses is you never knew how they were going to respond until they were battle tested. And so some of the, the cavalry men, when they went out into their first battle on, a, say, a new horse, the first time uh, they went out, the, the horse might react in a, in a bad way. So they might, we, we call it around here, if you're in eastern Oklahoma, we call it the horse got spooked. You know what I mean? Someone gets kicked off and somebody gets hurt, right? That's what happens. Uh, but in this case, these, they were in battle. Like there was an enemy trying to destroy them. So as they would ride out on these horses, sometimes they would freak out. The horses would turn and run and buck and, and try to escape. And Paul's like, hey. Don't be like that. Don't be like those irrational beasts that don't understand what's going on. Don't be frightened in any way. He said, we go into battle with resolve, in no way alarmed by our opponents. Our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in the power of the Spirit of God at work within us. The same Spirit that saved us from our sins, and we got a bunch, right, is the Spirit now at work through us in the world. And Paul reminds us here, it has been granted for Christ's sake. For you who are a believer in Jesus Christ, who has received this gift of salvation, this grant of salvation, which all of us would say is a gift, right? It has been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe, not only to be saved, not only to go to heaven one day. It has been granted. This is a gift to you. It's a gift to me. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It was true of the believers at Philippi a couple of thousand years ago. And it's true for us. It is a gift that we could suffer for the sake of the gospel. It is a gift to us that we can conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus came and he suffered and he bled and he died for us. And it's a gift that we might get to do the same for him. There's a version of Christianity that really sees the faith as just another means to your own comfort. Nobody wants to go to hell. We really want God to bless our lives. So I'm going to pray a prayer, I'm going to walk an aisle, I'm going to get baptized, and just ask God to overall make my life better. It's a version of Christianity that you won't find in the scriptures. Let's be really clear. There are extraordinary benefits to the gospel. We know that one day we're going to be in heaven. We get to rule and reign with Christ. Like we're going to have new bodies. There will be no more suffering, no more dying, no more pain. Like there will be a day that we look forward to when this life is over. We see Jesus face to face. Like we're going to get to be in heaven for an eternity. But just for a little while, he's left us here to live lives worthy of the gospel. Because God didn't just love us. He loves that person that you're praying for. He loves your neighbor. He loves that person you sit next to at school. He loves the person you're going to see in the office this week. He loves them, and he wants to save them too. The question for us as the church of Jesus Christ is, will we live lives worthy of the glorious gospel we've received? Would you bow with me? Father, we believe in your goodness. We have seen love 
from Christ that, Lord, while we were sinners, Lord, while we mocked you, while we rebelled against you, while we sinned against you, God, you demonstrated your love for us in this, that, that you sent Christ to die for us in the midst of that sin. Father, having experienced such love, I pray that we would extend such love. I pray that Cross Community Church would live lives worthy of the gospel, that we would see our opportunity to suffer as a gift. Lord, may we stand firm. May we strive together. And may we have confidence in you in no way alarmed. I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.